Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the Accelerated MBA for Business Graduates. I appreciate you taking time out of what I'm sure is a, a busy day after a long weekend. And uh, happy 4th of July to those, and hopefully you had a nice Canada Day weekend as well. Uh, first, let's acknowledge that the Smith School of Business at Queen's University and the studio is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. And we're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these islands, or this island known as Turtle Island. And welcome to everybody. My name is Glenn Hollis. I'm the director of the Accelerated uh, MBA at Smith School of Business. And uh, first step in looking for a business school, you can see down in the picture there, uh, you've got a Starbucks. And that's always a good screener when you're looking at business schools. And I know you're looking around at MBA schools, and you should. It's a big step. It's an important step. And uh, we're quite proud of our MBA and the programs here at Smith and uh, look forward to speaking to you about that. I'm delighted that I have uh, a guest with me today. A guest really is uh, our in-house faculty, Professor Barry Cross. And I'll talk more about Barry uh, as we get closer to the mini lecture piece that we've got planned for today. But I'm delighted to have Professor Cross here with us, of course. So. This MBA, and again, this is really the, the one-page highlight, the uh, elevator speech, as they say. It's a Queen's MBA in one year, while you work, and in your home city. And it was designed a little better than a dozen years ago for exactly this reason. People cannot stop out from their busy career as they grow and advance, and people don't want to necessarily leave the town in which they live and work. And we'll talk more about that. So this is the, the criteria I encourage you to look at when you are looking at an MBA. And we're quite proud, as I said, of, the, of our MBA program. Flexibility is key. And this was, as I said, designed intentionally so that you could stay where you live and where you work and not stop out from your career for a year or two or bleed it out over three or four years in a part-time format. The diverse perspective we'll talk a lot about uh, under this idea of pan-Canadian. Other MBAs, all other MBAs tend to be city or city area specific. And this is about a cross Canada MBA. And the preparation and support, we can talk about the preparation when it comes to our boot camp that we've put into place that was built intentionally to get people back into that mode again of school, uh, the cadence and rhythm of school, which uh, some have been out of for a number of years. And when you're in the MBA, it's about support. And I'll talk about that. This is a team MBA. We designed this years ago, really built it off a McKinsey study that was uh, looking at teams as the future of business. And it was called Decoding Leadership. And it looked at 20 plus characteristics of strong leaders for tomorrow. And two thirds of those skills were what might be considered softer skills, but truly they're team building skills. And we'll talk more about the design of this, but you will be on a team. And the other thing you look at when you look for an MBA is the reputation of a school. And critically, a huge part of your ROI is the connection, the alumni group that you'll be a part of for life. So this MBA, we've got boardrooms that are set up in cities across Canada, not just a Kingston specific piece or a GTA or a Vancouver or Montreal. This is about boardrooms in Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, downtown Toronto, Markham, Mississauga, Ottawa, and Montreal. We've also put into place three years ago, a similar approach that we take in the executive MBA and the MBA of the Americas, the joint Cornell and Queens program, and that is virtual teams. And we're pulling in people that are doing some phenomenal things in markets where we may not have a hard boardroom, but just some amazing uh, people that we're able to bring into the program that adds to the robust richness of this MBA, different from other MBAs that are out there. The perspective also looks at not just the geography, but it looks at the sectors as well. And we've got a cross section of many different sectors as part of this MBA. People doing some amazing things across the country in diverse sectors and also within diverse job descriptions and job titles as well. 32 different industries that are represented, 70 plus different job titles right across Canada in all of those markets. You're looking at the group that's in now, and this is the January picture as we brought this group in. And I know they look like you uh, because I'm already enrolling a number of students. I've got about 63 that we've enrolled for next year. We've got space, we've got availability, but I'm building the team as we speak. And we've already started to enroll some amazing folks that are in this program. So this is January when they first arrived here for the two weeks that I'll talk about. 
And this is most recently, a couple of weeks ago, when they're here for the June in-person session. And they're outfitted in team wear because we had them out for what we call the Smith Challenge, running about the campus around the university and really building teams, building their network, taking in some amazing courses, but also connecting with each other. They are across the board in many different companies. And this doesn't capture all of the organizations and brands that we've got students in, but it's representative and just some phenomenal industries and brands that people are a part of, that you're a part of, as I know you're looking at your MBA. The support piece that I mentioned is unique. We call it the Smith Edge, four facets of coaching. You will have a team coach that works with your team. You set out the rules of engagement, how you work together, how you communicate, how you get work done. Half your grade is teams and half is individual. So there is a strong focus on teams. You'll do peer reviews on each other halfway through. How do I become a stronger, better team member, leader, and supporter? We've also got executive coaching. These are dedicated hours, your hours, that you're going to have access to for an executive coach. And these are people that are varied and interesting out in the industry for many years. And you can speak to them about the cross-section of life meets work, of mentoring you as you think about where your career is headed. Lifestyle coaching. It's important to be balanced. So we've got coaching that's dedicated to nutrition, fitness, and mental health. And that's an important piece of being a strong leader. And finally, we've got elements of a career coach in uh, elements of coaching within career itself. Most of you are interested in understanding how do I use my MBA where I am? How do I be seen as a high potential? How do I use it to advance, to get exposure to different areas of business, promotions? And some of you now or eventually are ready to pivot, interested in different sectors or within the same sector, how do I move to this brand? And you're gonna have one-on-one -on -one, one -on hours with a career coach. And that's an important part of your MBA as well. You're also going to have access to the Career Center for Life. And that's a great connection to make. The connections and reputation we've got here at Queens at the Smith School of Business, we're quite proud of. 180,000 plus Queens graduates, different, faculties, law, medicine, arts, engineering, education, business, 26,000 within business alone. And you've got colleagues spread out across Canada and around the world. And these are going to be those that you work with, work for, or you end up hiring. There will be a connection to a Queen's Business School alum for sure. The way that we conduct the approach to this MBA is blended. So while well, most of your lectures are going to be delivered like this, and Professor Cross will take you through a bit of a tour shortly, we also have live sessions that happen two weeks in January, a week in June, and then a final week in December. And these are opportunities for everybody across Canada to come together during a live session. Private hotel, top level food, in your business school, amazing networking and social building. Other lectures, we deliver live lectures throughout the year every other Sunday and half day Monday. And Professor Cross can speak more to that. So here we are, we're at Queen's University in Kingston. And if you narrow down a little bit, there's your business school. And in the business school, in the basement, we've got two state-of-the-art studios. And Professor Cross can tell you more about those. So let me get right to the meat of this, our taste test lecture, if you will, and I'm excited. We welcome our deeply experienced, 20 year plus experienced faculty member, Barry Cross. Barry is an expert and thought leader in innovation, execution, and operations strategy. He joined the Smith School of Business nearly 20 years in, after nearly 20 years in the automotive and advanced manufacturing sector, right across North America, Asia, Latin America, and Europe. Barry speaks and consults widely in the areas of lean, innovation, strategy, and execution. He is the best-selling author of three books, including Simple, Killing Complexity for a Lean and Agile Organization. Professor Cross lectures in our full master's portfolio, including our full-time MBA, executive MBA, MBA of the Americas, and of course, in your accelerated MBA program. Teaching award recipient, as voted by students, for the last three years, I give you Professor Barry Cross. All right, 
Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our session here uh, this afternoon, this afternoon in Ontario time, that is. Uh, really terrific to be here in the studio with Glenn, uh, with producer Tim, as well as we uh, give you a sense of kind of what you're getting into, I, I think is the intent here with, you know, a little bit of content, a little bit of theory. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the adage that there's no free lunch. And while we're broadcasting over lunch hour, I'm going to make you think a little bit as well. So uh, that, that's part of the deal that we've got. And I've got maybe 20 minutes of your time. Before we get started, I'd like to actually uh, share a couple of other uh, studio uh, live streams with you, just to give you a sense for the technology that Glenn just talked about a minute ago. And Tim, if you're able to uh, give us a shot of, of you in, in the chair over there, to give people a sense of, of the production studio. All right, so uh, with Tim, if you can see it, if you can put that, there it is, that camera, and give you a sense of, the call it the tech that goes into what we're doing here and broadcasting across the country, live streaming, and then a shot of the studio where Glenn and I are, uh, you get a, a sense, see, okay, there, there's Glenn, and uh, I'm over on the, the far side standing up next to the big screen. Um, so it, it is truly, it's a television production quality uh, streaming, it, it's that synchronous it's it's that live and when glenn talks about the majority of your sessions being broadcast to you live wherever you are whether you're part of a virtual team or you're part of a boardroom team in say edmonton or vancouver or toronto um we are interacting with you live and at that time and it's a you know a three and a half hour session interactive breakouts team activities discussion back and forth and all of that type of thing so really wanted to give you a sense of, of what that looked like and we've been doing this this way now and this is kind of gen 5 of the studio but we've been doing it this way now since the early 90s we pioneered this learning tactic and, and this whole pan canadian experience it, it's part of the way that we've been doing these types of mbas now for a long time all right so with that um as i said uh we've got a bit of a taste of some content or some uh call it academic uh, knowledge that we want to share with you here this afternoon. And the title of my talk here is the idea of breaking the mold and really helping our organizations think differently about where they're going and what that opportunity looks like. And we call that entrepreneurship. Now, entrepreneurship is that, that field of innovation within an existing organization. So it's less about the entrepreneurship, the startup, the people working away in a garage or a basement saying, hey, this is what we want to do in this new you know, model that we're going to build. It's us looking at the organizations that we're in right now and saying, you know what, we need to do a better job evaluating the way that we work, the way that we do things. And that's really indifferent of the type of organization you're part of now. This applies to the private sector, sure, banking, telecom, retail, but it also applies to healthcare, it applies to government and basically every avenue of business. And this is the type of stuff that we've been driving with these organizations, your organizations now for you know, a long time. I was invited into this program back in 2008. Uh, so I, I've been teaching in this program now, what is that, 14 years or something like that. It's kind of a silly number. Um, it's interesting when we think about innovation and entrepreneurship inside of these existing organizations, Every firm in the world talks about this kind of stuff. They really do. They, they've got it as part of their visions, their goals. We will be more creative. We will be more innovative. And you'd think that with that level of alignment, of engagement at the senior leadership level, that this stuff should be easy. We should be able to drive that forward, right? Maybe not so much. There's all kinds of challenges and reasons why these organizations struggle a little bit to be more creative, why they're looking for people like you to help them initiate and drive some of that activity. Right. So when you think about it, and, and this is part of that thinking activity that I referred to a minute ago, you know, why is this important? And feel free to punch this into the Q&A and we'll bring up some of your, you know, your live thoughts here as part of this process. By the way, in a real, call it interactive studio session where we're teaching, I can actually see your faces up on the screen. We can engage in a one-on-one -on -one or a team dis discussion. So we'll use a bit of the, the Zoom technology for our, our exercise here this afternoon. But why now? Why are firms so concerned about the idea of execution and innovation? Yeah, and, and you know what, when I, when I see the answers coming in, obviously high levels of competition. We see more and more of that type of competition. And interestingly, that competition is coming from more, call it uh, broad and diverse geographical areas. It's coming from new players in our particular sector. Those of you in banking, 
you know, imagine, you know, the, the fintech players and the people who are not those traditional banks now coming in and, and trying to eat a slice of your pie. Um, we look at funding challenges, absolutely. Funding challenges, and you think about education specifically, and anybody with, call it children or siblings still in that uh, public education system. And here in Ontario, where you know there is no more funding for those schools, in fact, that funding is being slashed. That applies to the university level. It applies to a lot of different organizations where public levels of funding are not what they have been in the past and what many of us believe that they should be going forward, all kinds of challenges like that. And then we, you know, interestingly, we start talking about some of those environmental challenges and some of those elements of society that, you know, most recently it was the pandemic, but there's a lot of these environmental challenges that are having an impact on the way that we work, right? And here's just a few of those examples. Thank you very much for your participation. That's exactly what we're talking about. You know, we can talk about the inflation that we're seeing now in the economy, right? And that, that especially when you look at transportation costs, you look at groceries, cost of living, everything else, that's been running significantly higher than historical levers, levels over the last two years. Everybody's aware of the talent shortage, you know, and our ability to find, you know, good people inside of our organizations. Where are they coming from? Um, some of you are, rem are working remotely and the ability to find people to work inside of our organization is often predicated these days on their ability to work at least at some level remotely. Some of the other challenges we've got, public sentiment, and that one might feel a little bit odd, but I'll show you what I'm talking about here in just a second. Uh, the pandemic's influence is still ongoing, and then obviously things like technology and, and you know, the, the chat GPT phenomenon where somebody can actually say, okay, write me a an essay on Shakespeare's work about Macbeth, you know, and have that, that chat function generate this, you know, um, submission, you know, for an assignment. This is creating challenges and discussion opportunities for everybody going forward, right? What's actually authentic work? So when you look at these particular influences, I want to take a step back now. And what I've got for you are three examples of organizations that are finding a way to rally against some of these very significant you know barriers that are in front of them right now right so let's talk about public sentiment first and the example i've got for you is cvs pharmacy now this is interesting if we go back just a few years cvs leadership at the highest level said you know what we are essentially a health-based organization yet we're continuing to sell these tobacco products so they made the very difficult decision to say, you know, what we're going to do is to actually exit that business. We are going to exit tobacco products. So imagine the board of directors at that time and, in, you know, institutional level investors and everybody else saying, you want to get rid of a product line that generates $2 billion a year in revenue for your business. Yeah, we do. We really do. And we're transitioning out of those types of products towards a larger health-based organization. And that's who we're going to be. And imagine the challenges they faced in, in driving that execution forward, right? Here's another one. And this one was particularly meaningful. And it seems like we can't, you know, open a website or pick up a newspaper these days without seeing evidence of some of these tragedies. But um, just a few years ago, the CEO of Dick's Sporting Goods down again, south of the border, witnessed yet another tragedy down in Florida. I think at this, it was this time. And he said, you know what? We're either part of the problem or we're part of the solution. And right away, they exited the assault rifle business and have exited firearms you know, in, in most of their stores as well now. And once again, you look at the revenue and, and the particular product line that we're talking about, and that's obviously things that uh, something that people get pretty excited about. In both of these cases, it's important to point out that leadership in the organization is saying, okay, based on what's happening in society, we are prepared to move away from a particular group of customers and reposition our organization targeting an entirely new customer segment. And I think that's pretty exciting. When you take a step back and say, okay, yeah, we're giving up significant amount of revenue for our business. We're potentially angering particular customers and we're prepared to do it because it's the right thing for our organization. These are significant and substantial changes and reacting to some of these environmental challenges that we referred to just earlier. Here's one that's a little more fun. 
there's a restaurant out in Seattle called Addo. It's a uh, proprietor is a guy called Eric Rivera and they specialize on this kind of Puerto Rican American fusion type cuisine. It's a bistro establishment and, and just an awesome place to hang out if you're in the Seattle area. Now, obviously in the pandemic, he was one of the, you know, literally thousands of organizations that had to close their doors. And he said, you know what? I could pivot, right? I could pivot towards more of a takeout type environment. People still want to eat, but I want to do something interesting. So what he did was actually transform his restaurant into call it these meals at home that you would prepare yourself. And what it looked like is here's a whole bunch of prepaid kits and today's Thursday or Friday or whatever it is. And they've got different things on the menu. You're going to pick up that kit or we can have it delivered right? That's part one. You're going to prepare this meal now yourself. We're going to have people, our chefs, myself standing by uh, for a Zoom call, or you can watch some of our YouTube videos. We've got a sommelier online as well to recommend beer or wine or other beverage pairings with that particular product. You can have a few of your friends or family over. You can create an experience around it. And what he found by doing that was that they are actually busier than they were pre-pandemic he actually had to hire more staff. And I think that's really cool. When you look at a lot of these organizations say, okay, what are we gonna do? How do we stay open? Maybe we will actually close and take government funding in the meantime. He said, I'm going to find a way to make my business even better. Now we joked about it afterwards. He said, I may never go back to the traditional restaurant stream of business. I may keep doing what I'm doing now. Now, obviously he went back, he opened their doors and now he's got this separate call it other business, this side hustle, so to speak, that he's doing as a proprietor that's driving, you know, those experiential occasions when we just want to do this somewhere else. We want to do this at home, right? Interesting. Now, how did he get there? Well, he, you know, even in a restaurant like this, he's always had a bit of an incubator. And this is where we start grabbing some of those ideas and populating new opportunities. And some of your organizations have the same opportunities. What are you doing with those ideas? How are you capturing them? How are you exploiting them to create new value for your customers going forward? Okay. There's our question. Last example, I wanted to kind of cross a few different avenues here for us. Uh, this one's from healthcare. Now it's interesting when you look at the data, we've got a real challenge in front of us here in the number of boomers and seniors that are going to be in that elderly demographic over the next number of years, that's expected to quadruple, right? This is awesome in one hand where we, we're going to have more of our family members around for a longer period of time. But when I get into a health challenge, let's say I stumble, I hurt my hip, whatever, or I've got to go into the healthcare system for a particular procedure. The challenge we've got with that increase in numbers is that more and more of these people are kind of getting trapped within that system. While I'm there getting treated for that acute issue, I catch something else or I find something else that doesn't allow me to leave. So there's some smart people looking at this and you know the, the standard solution that we talk about is building more hospitals, hiring more doctors. And that is a long-term, very expensive proposal, right? There are other ways, right? And there's one that's actually been uh, proposed and implemented by a very smart guy called Dr. Samir Sina. Now he works out at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto and he's their chief of geriatric care. And he started by asking a question of their board of directors. And he said, you know what, are we a hospital or a hotel? And obviously he got some confused looks, some kind of leaning back in their chair responses. Well, what do you mean, doctor? Well, you know what, we don't get meals in bed at home. Why are we doing that in the hospital? Well, that's just the way that we do things. He said, well, I've got an idea for you. And he asked for $40,000 in funding. He wanted to run a trial. This trial, look like this. He basically created this ACE ward, this acute care for elderly, where traditionally these elderly patients are salted in different wards and departments around various hospitals and treated like all of our other patients. Well, you know what? These people are a little bit different. When we start to bundle them together, group them together, you know what? They like kind of hanging out with people like them. And what they actually did was create an environment, redesign that entire ward to focus on the needs of these particular customers. Some of the things they did, they lowered all the beds in this clinic. And think about traditional bed height for hospitals. The number one cause of falls with this demographic in the hospitals getting in and out of bed. 
And that's because the beds are up at this height. That's for the practitioner, not for the patient. Let's lower the beds down to normal bed height. Let's take away their slippers, give them non-slip socks that we leave on their feet while they're with us the entire stay, right? Give them a new pair every day. Yes, you can take them home with you, dear. Let's have them move up and down the halls three times a day for their meals. And imagine that where they're getting meals in bed before, we're going to increase early ambulation. We're going to get them up and moving three times a day. They're going to walk down the hall. We will help them. We will guide them. We will give them walkers, crutches. We'll have you know orderlies with them, whatever they need. But you are going to move up and down that hall three times a day. But you know what? You're going to meet people. You're going to socialize. You're going to interact with other people like you in that dining room. You're going to exchange pictures. Pictures, excuse me. Here's our granddaughter. She's doing her MBA at Queens. We're very proud of her. You know, and, and that type of social activity that, that your grandparents are doing now. And then we're going to mute all the phones, create a real non-paging environment. The impact of all of this type of stuff, you know what? These people slept like babies. They slept better than they do at home in some cases. And all of that interaction and social activity and movement and everything else, they were happier. They slept more soundly. They checked out and recovered more quickly to the point where our costs went down by 23%, right? Cost of care per patient. We saved $6 million as a hospital in 2014. This is Dr. Cena reporting out, yet they increased the capacity. If our patients are there for less time, we're freeing up critical capacity that I can use to you know, treat more patients. That's the kind of solution that we need more of. That's the kind of thing that helps us fix healthcare. So these are the types of things where, you know, you take smart people in challenged scenarios, difficult environments, and you give them the opportunity to create value in new ways. They're going to come up with ideas. They're just like you, right? They want to fix stuff. That's what we're about as part of this discussion. So you look at these organizations, you know, so many organizations, don't appreciate this, but this is what I'll call a business model life cycle. And for me, this is a law. Every business model in the world will eventually come to an end. And as, as part of that process, you know, when it, where we've got this change event that I refer to that forces it to, you know, adapt, to improvise, to overcome. Some of you may recommend or recognize that as a, a line from a movie. But my question for you is, do these organizations appreciate when they've hit that event, when they've reached the maturity in their business model life cycle? And I want you to think again and maybe punch it into the Q&A for a second and just have a look, you know, in your mind, why, why don't organizations appreciate that? Why don't they recognize when they've reached the end of a particular life cycle? Right? There's a number of reasons. Obviously, they're profitable. If you talk about the big banks, we're still recording and reporting significant profitability, especially during the pandemic. And, you know, the senior leadership in those organizations would look at it and say, well, yeah, why would we do anything different? You know, things are working right now. Same thing with the telecoms and a lot of organizations. But the symptoms to me, this is when you start to lose some of your best people. Your best people are recognizing, you know, we've kind of done what we can do in that particular model. We're going to move on now. You lose some of your best customers. You start to see, uh, you know, changes in technology. You see yourself as an organization starting to compete on price. There's a number of symptoms that we can see at the mature level of a particular business model life cycle. Right? You know what, though? Right behind that is another business model. The beauty of it in this case, is it's going to be people like you that are able to take that scenario, situation, environment that you're working in and create that next business model, like CVS and Dick's Sporting Goods, like Eric Rivera at Addo, like Dr. Samir Sina at Mount Sinai Hospital. These are people that recognize the limitations of that existing business model in which they're working and said, you know what? We don't have to accept the status quo. We can drive that change and take it forward ourselves. That's the type of stuff that gets Glenn and I very excited about the potential of people in a program like this. And we look forward to seeing what some of those elements and changes can look like. All right, now, um, how do you get people's attention? That, that's really where we are right now. And when I'm working directly with an organization or talking to CEOs or alumni, 
you know, these are some of those tough questions that start to get us a little more focused, perhaps. Think about your own organization. How are we different from other firms in our industry? And are we truly best at anything? Are we best at anything within our particular field? What would it take to knock off one of the big firms in our business? Who may not be there in 10 minutes? Or sorry, in 10 years, 10 minutes. Um, inside of government, this applies as well. And think about that next budget that may be coming up in which agencies within government may see diminished or lost funding. While I choose to reallocate resources as you know, political leadership over to another opportunity. That happens as well. Given a choice, why do patients choose to come to our hospital or clinic? You know, is it because we're close or because of good care? And anytime we've got customers making a convenience decision versus a bestness, bestness decision, you know, that's an opportunity for us, right? You know, and even demographically, you know, why do we choose to live in our particular city? And this is where municipalities have to compete more than they have perhaps in the past, when you can choose to literally live or work anywhere, why would I choose to live in this particular city? What's special about it? Why do I wanna be here? All right, so all of this to me connects back to what I refer to as Canada's productivity problem. And this is very on a soapbox here just a little bit, but this is an opportunity for us. This is where organizations and government have to start taking this very seriously. Sure, we are at you know, we are among the best places to live in the world, have been for a number of years, but honestly, we are dismal when it comes to our overall national productivity. And it's actually gotten worse over the last number of years. And you'd look at all of that and you'd say, okay, Barry, so what? What's that got to do with anything? Why are we here today? Well, I'll tell you what, when you start to think about the processes at, at Mount Sinai Hospital, Imagine if more organizations started to focus like Dr. Cena did towards enhancing the productivity of their existing resources. What would that mean for healthcare in Canada? Imagine the competitive position of those banks or retailers if they started talking about the way they work and finding a way to compete and defining some of that bestness. What would that look like? And imagine a world where Canada isn't just a great place to work but we're also an amazing, sorry, a great place to live, but we're also an amazing place to work. And this last one here, which is just a pet peeve of my own, imagine a world where Canada didn't have to write a $13 billion check to Volkswagen to encourage them to put up a new shop here for an electric battery plant. Imagine they came here because of the capabilities of the various people and organizations. Right? And I think that world could be pretty special. It just takes, again, people like you to commit to identifying what that's going to look like. And I'm very excited about the way that that turns out. So with that, we'll open the floor to some questions. I'll turn it back to our host, Glenn, the director of the program and say, thank you very much for being here with us today. Great, thank you, Barry, appreciate that. And again, as Barry said, throw anything you want in the Q and A, uh, anything referring to Barry's mini lecture, uh, anything about the program, things we haven't answered. We've only got three slides to finish this, but again, in addition to networking, uh, advancement, learning, I mean, this MBA is, is about, you know, really thinking and recharging the batteries. Uh, you know, we talk and hear a lot about people who finish their MBA and it's a sense of confidence, the confidence to progress through, to sit at the C-suite table, sit around and, and you know, feel like you, you're you worthy of being there is, is a big element I hear back from MBA students. So again, throw anything you want in the Q&A as we're going through this. So the checklist you saw off the top, think about this in addition to having a Starbucks, and we do. Um, think about this seriously when you're looking at your MBA. Um, we're very proud of the structure of this MBA. Uh, I'd, I'd be delighted to talk more about it. Um, a big part of the next steps are connecting with somebody and you are going to be connecting with humans. We're looking for those with an undergraduate in business, a BCom, a BBA. Um, you're gonna see uh, you know, that we need two years at least work experience. The reason that we don't require a GMAT is because you've got that underpinning, an undergraduate in business, you already understand all of the elements in business, the usual suspects that we've all gone through. You've gone through finance and macro and microeconomics, organizational behavior, operations, strategy, accounting. All of those are the basics. And it's really about the next gear level as we work through the MBA. Barry's course is one of 18. In fact, Barry and I sat down through a curriculum review a couple of years ago really looked at those courses as far as advancing this MBA. And 
The entrepreneurship is, an, is a perfect example of that. We had an entrepreneurship program and we still do as an elective, but there were so many students that came from medium, large and extra large matrix companies that said, I've got great ideas, but I don't know how to get them up and through a big bureaucratic organization. How do I get them through to the different silos? How do they get them to the C-suite table? And how do I get them sold? How do I get to minimal viable product? And how do I work with all of the different groups around me? And this is why we put the entrepreneurship piece into the program that Barry teaches. I'm delighted that we've got it. So your application is about talking to a human. It is about the next step. There's five elements to this, the resume, transcripts, cover letter. We're interested in references, of course. Critically, you're going to talk to me. And the reason that you do that is we want to understand team fit. Are you going to get value out of this MBA and are you going to add value to your team? And that's a big piece of it for sure. So I invite you to throw in any questions. Next steps, it's simple. You can email Carrie. Carrie's a human and she's delighted to speak with you and she can start the process and uh, we'll, we'd love to speak to you for sure. So again, let's look for questions and throw anything you want into the Q&A and I'm happy to see that as we're going through, okay. And again, take your time and throw those in. Okay, question to Barry. Barry, what's it like to teach a diverse group? So I talked about the diversity of the group. What's it like to teach you know, that diverse group, many different sectors, backgrounds, they come from across Canada. What's that like as a faculty member, Barry? Well, uh, yeah, you know what, that, that's part of the, you know, the, the best part of the program for me. Um, not only call it geographic diversity, and while you may be positioned now in say Edmonton or Halifax, but, but many of the people in the room come from other parts of the world as well. And, and such a broad and rich element of experience and background that makes for some incredible conversations and discussions, you know, and, and gone are the days, maybe this is part of an undergrad. It certainly was part of my undergrad and maybe Glenn's back in the day as well, where the prophet walk into the room and, you know, right on the board for kind of 80 minutes and, and may not even realize there's people in the room, but ours, you know, it, it's an interactive, you know, we've got some content and theory that we've got to get through as well, but it's, it's very much discussion based. And when I can hear the comments from across the group, you know, and people, you know, talking about, you know, what it means to them in their industry or their background or their geography, um, you know, that, that makes from, you know, it, it's enriching for people they, they realize the potential, they realize, hey, I've got, you know, maybe a lot more in common with, with some of the people in, in this group than maybe what I thought initially when I was just kind of signing up and registering. Um, it, it, it really is a way to, to realize the, the opportunity for my network that I'm developing. And, you know, as Glenn's pointed out a couple of times, it's, it's not just you getting that credential, that, that certificate at the end of the program. It's, you know, these are 100 people plus that you're going to get to know very well. And, and some of them you're going to know for the rest of your life, whether you choose to work together or some opportunity or, or just hang out and connect. And, and that's, that's, that, that's exciting for me. It's interesting. And I love that part of the program. Great. Thank you for that, Barry. Another question that came in. Glenn, you talked about preparation. I've been out of school for five plus years. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable about starting again. Uh, what do you do at the Queen's School of Business at Smith to prepare students to, to enter their MBA? Um, again, part of that review that Barry and I and a number of faculty uh, and others worked on years ago was talking to alumni. And I look back, talked to five years back, and one of the things they said is, I wish there was a boot camp, something that could prepare me to uh, get back into that rhythm of school again. So we actually put a boot camp into place and there's a number of elements to that. You're gonna do a psychological analysis. You're going to do some resilience mapping. This is well before you even start. And then we're also gonna give you access. I worked with two professors, Dr. Henry Schneider and Dr. Schneider is the professor that teaches economics. And he put together 10 videos that you get access to as early as October before you start. And it reminds and refreshes, it doesn't repeat, but it reminds and refreshes you about core concepts, principles, and theories in micro and macroeconomics. And this is something you can self-drive and self-digest as you work through there. I worked with Erin Webster. Professor Webster teaches accounting in your accelerated MBA. And she put together six videos, again, early access before you start, reminding you how to read balance sheets and financial statements and pro formas. She actually looked at WestJet, tore down all of their public statements and really helped you to understand, remind and refresh me. 
Then we worked with the Marquee Group. And those of you in banking will know this. The Marquee Group, they teach the big five banks and they conduct a two-day session, virtual, in November, mid-November, before you start, and that's on financial modeling. And you can stream into beginner, intermediate, or advanced, depending on your background, experience, et cetera. Then we meet as a group, and this is late November, before you start, gather everybody together, we introduce the professors you're going to see in January, you meet your coaches, I'll do a mini workshop on presentation skills, We'll talk about how do you guys connect together before you start. And uh, we do that with Slack. So you can already start to network. Everybody hits the ground running. They feel more comfortable and they're set up for success. And we've heard back from students that said, that's just what I needed. I needed that preparatory piece to help me get back into that cadence again. So we're quite delighted with that. Uh, question, is there financing available? There is, and I'm happy to talk about that, but you can also see it on the website. We've got Dean's Entrance Scholarships for those that have done particularly well with their GPA and work experience, progressive work experience. We've got uh, scholarships for Black students, Indigenous students. We have the Forte Foundation, which is, looks at advancing women in business. And we've got two $10,000 scholarships as well. So you can also see that there's uh, preferable approaches with the CRA as far as using RRSPs. Uh, you can write off your uh, tuition component for that year. Um, and we also give you some connections as far as banks so that you can start the conversation. And the banks look at you as a very attractive prospect, given you're going to have your MBA from Queens and uh, you're working uh, prospects. So lots of opportunity to look at that for sure. Uh, another question for Barry. Um, you mentioned about uh, different from your undergraduate. What, they want to know how accessible faculty are at the master level. Oh, sure. Um... In, in fact, just this morning, I had a call, a video call with a couple of current students who are, you know, teaming up, you know, they, they work for different institutions right now, and they're teaming up for a potential new venture. Um, that, that type of call is fun. Uh, and, and it's something from an accessibility standpoint. I, I think myself and my colleagues do a very good job making sure that, you know, recognizing that, that you're geographically dispersed across the country and different schedules and workloads and everything else. Uh, you, you'll find that my peers and I are very, you know, call it widely available. And, and whether that's uh, response to quick email questions to, uh, hey, setting up a call during the week related to content that's being delivered at that time, or even something like my example from this morning where it's completely unrelated. Uh, to me, that's part of the job, um, you know, and, and there are different means of interacting and recognizing that, that often there's a bit of uh, you know, anxiety, perhaps, as far as directly interacting with, with faculty, you shouldn't feel that way. Um, th this is part of the deal with us. And this is part of what makes it a call it a wholesome experience for you while while you're here with us. And, and that, by the way, extends to after you graduate as well, we, we have all kinds of content from people, uh, sorry, contact from people who've, who've come back afterwards and said, Hey, Barry, can we set up a call? Can we, you know, talk about this? And, you know, that that's part of that ongoing relationship that, that we enjoy as faculty. So, uh, you know, as I said, that, that's part of the program and uh, part of what you, you get here is, you know, with your registration in the program. Great. I, I actually think Barry's understating that a little bit. I, I talked to him a while ago and I said, um, what about that student we have? Remember that guy uh, at Snow Lab? Um, he, now, any of you know what Snow Lab is uh, up in Sudbury, Sudbury? Yep. Two kilometers below the earth, an old nickel mine, of course, in Sudbury. They've, they've outfitted now to do nuclear fission testing or something like that. So um, this student, having, having taken uh, Barry's operations course, uh, really wanted to understand about how do we get more efficient, uh, more productive um, through our company, our organization. So I said, I said to Barry, uh, do you remember that snow lab uh, place, that, that neat thing that was two kilometers below the earth? He said, yeah, I've been there. So Barry picked up the phone when the student called and actually went there um, to go two kilometers below the earth which I haven't talked to Barry again about, and we certainly haven't rehearsed this, but I was impressed with that accessibility. So anyway, um, not that he will go two kilometers under the earth for everybody, but um, <laughs> that's the kind of interaction we've got here. So um, again, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. This is valuable. And uh, I know it uh, is a, a step out of your day. I look forward to speaking with you. You know how to contact uh, our team um, and we'd be delighted to speak with you for sure. I wanna thank Tim in the studio. I want to thank Elizabeth in the background that's done a lot of work setting this up. And of course, I want to thank uh, Professor Barry Cross for his time 
and uh, our mini lecture. And thank you all for joining us today. All the best. We'll speak to you soon.